Welcome to Data Skeptic. Regular listeners will know we're in the midst of something I'm calling pilot season, where we're trying out new themes for the show. I've got one more serious candidate for you, and that's going to be next week. Then we're all going to vote. For today, a quick aside, I want to talk to you today about something called the flesh Kincaid readability tests. What they are, their potential role in machine learning and broader data science and perhaps natural language processing problems in particular. So the flesh Kincaid readability tests, it's a pair of tests, which are, they're both basically the same thing. They're methods of attempting to estimate the difficulty of a text, or conversely, the ease of a text and how easy it is to read it and understand it. So surely this must be some deep neural network-based architecture, some new thing, some BERT enhancement, GPT-3, whatever, right? Not at all. These were developed in the 70s by two researchers working for the Navy, the U.S. Navy. And in my research, I wasn't able to come up with a whole lot of details on why they developed this precisely, or even how they fine-tuned some of its parameters. But actually, none of that's going to matter. A couple of interesting notes. The state of Florida here in the U.S. requires that insurance policies have a flesh reading ease score of 45 or greater. Oh, let me put that in perspective. The reading ease score is a number that's supposed to go from 0 to 100, 100 being the easiest to read, something that roughly an 11-year-old student would understand. And as you encounter more and more difficult examples of text, that score should drop all the way down to potentially a 0, with the guiding principle that anything in the 0 to 10 range requires a professional to read it, something that's in their area, it's extremely difficult text. University graduate students are likely to be consuming it. Now, actually, as you get into the mathematics of this thing, you'll find that's just sort of the intended range. You can actually get scores above and below that, but that's neither here nor there for the moment. The flesh reading E score, one of our two scores, attempts to rank things. Zero is hard, 100 is easy. So I did a little experiment you'll hear about later in the episode, and I used a Python library called TechStat. Pretty nice library, has this very simple thing implemented in it, although you could do this yourself just as well. Apparently Grammarly, the plugin, has it. I've got Grammarly, but I don't, I've never encountered this as one of the scores. Must be some extended option. And for those of you still rocking IBM Lotus Symphony, <laughs> you can get the scores in there as well, if you've got the five and a quarter floppies. Another point of reference borrowed here from Wikipedia, Moby Dick scores 57.9, implying that one would need college-level education. This is difficult to read. All right, so let's get down to brass tacks. How do we actually calculate this? Well, we're going to need three values, three statistics. The total words, the total sentences, and the total syllables. If you have a question about how to calculate syllables, there's an easy answer. I'm not going to get into it here. So those three values, we're going to make two ratios out of them. First, the ratio of total words to total sentences, a.k.a. the average words per sentence. And the second ratio, the total syllables over the total words, a.k.a. the average syllables per word. Next, let's apply some intuition and see if you can guess what the answers are going to be here. Starting with that first ratio, total words over total sentences, or average words per sentence, well, as that goes up, one might assume that the technical nature goes up. You know, what's the classic C-spot run? Short, blunt sentences. But then if you get into more technical writing where there's a lot of big words and different terminology and a possibly lists or even run-on sentences like the one that you'd find in the transcript if you were reading this sentence instead of listening to me out loud as I just continue to ramble on, the more of that I do, the more I'm going to make it, at least according to this score, difficult to understand. Perhaps your ears would agree. Similarly, total syllables over total words, or average syllables per word. Again, think C-spot run. Short, common, simple words tend to have a fewer syllables. So directionally speaking, yes, the higher these ratios go, the less easy it probably is to read the text. Clearly, this is a blunt instrumentation, although we'll explore in a little bit just how blunt and how useful or not useful this might be. But just to wrap up the formula of it, you start with a very large number, a fine-tuned number of around 206 for whatever reason, <laughs> and we're going to subtract those two ratios, uh, but give them a little scalar. So subtract a small number, just around one for the average words, and then you subtract a whopping almost 85 for the ratio of syllables to words. 
Why those numbers? Couldn't figure it out. Didn't actually care much. I thought I'd just look empirically into this and see if I like the thing and either use it or not, depending on the results as I find them. How the original researchers fine-tuned those three constants, I don't know. Let's move along. When I first encountered this, I was pretty critical of it because it's really simple. I thought, how useful could this be? It would be very easy to to kind of hack this, you know, to take a children's book and apply generative adversarial network to keep the meaning of the sentence but bulk out these ratios. And of course, you could do that pretty easily, but why? (laughs) The proof is going to be in the pudding. So in a moment, I'll describe an experiment I did. After that, we'll talk about the results and whether or not I think this is a good metric to use in any implementations, any real-world use cases. But before we get into that, let me give it a few compliments. First of all, it is very fast and easy to calculate this. It's just arithmetic, nothing fancy. Second, it's actually even more efficient than a lot of things. There's no standard deviation in here. There are just totals, so you can sum those with counters. Thus, very memory efficient. You could run this on a streaming platform with incredibly high velocity and volume of data, and you would find it quite easy to calculate this. On the other hand, if you wanted to calculate an embedding vector for every piece of text you have flowing through in some streaming system, there's a higher computational cost to that. You need more system resources. It's an embarrassingly parallel problem, so that's easy to scale up. But even still, as you optimize for cost and throughput and things like that, perhaps in whatever you're working on, a multi-phased approach could work. You know, could very simple systems like this one provide you with a filter across a large percentage of the documents coming through that just immediately eliminate things that you're not going to be interested in doing deeper, more expensive feature engineering work on? Definitely a possible optimization. Even if you don't want to go there, or if you want to still go to all those places, compute an embedding vector for whatever analysis you're doing, Perhaps something like the reading e-score would be an additional engineered feature you might want to offer to your machine learning algorithm. If it's not useful, the algorithm shouldn't pick it up. Given how easy it is to compute, why not give stuff like this a try if you're in an exploratory phase for some natural language processing problem? Well, the reason would be if it was a waste of time, I guess. So let's talk about my experiment. Everyone knows about Wikipedia. Most of you probably have at least one tab open right now with Wikipedia on it. As you know, Wikipedia comes in many languages. Did you know there's a language just like you can have EN for English? There is SIMPLE for Simple English. Go hack your URL, change EN to SIMPLE, and you'll get the equivalent page on that side. Simple English is an attempt to present the text in an easier way that someone who is maybe learning English as a second language or a young student learning English could better understand the articles. It uses a restricted vocabulary and some other guidelines to make simple sentences. And it's pretty cool, too. Sometimes I've uh, taken time to look at the English page and then its equivalent, and it's kind of fun to see some of the ways the authors have done these. You have to do a little bit of mental gymnastics sometimes to describe things in a simple yet truthful way. There's some neat linguistical tricks they apply. I'd recommend you look at some of those pages. It's fun. But of course, why I'm interested in it here is to do an experiment. Are these readability scores useful? And In the spirit of Karl Popper, maybe I can try and falsify that and say that they're not. Surely it must be the case that simple English Wikipedia should be scored in a way that suggests it's easier to read, right? Otherwise, what's the point? Either they've done a terrible job creating simple English Wikipedia, which anecdotally I know is not true, or the readability scores are off. So I'm going to get a big set of Wikipedia pages from both English and then the same pages on the simple English. I'm going to compute these scores, look at some histograms, and make up my mind. I know you're hot with anticipation. Let's break for our sponsor and then get back into the results. Let me put a recommendation in front of you. Built for Tomorrow, the podcast. It's a show about crazy, curious things from history that shaped us and how we can shape the future. It's a great compliment to Data Skeptic in this regard. Each episode is deeply researched, but fast-paced and funny. For example, they've explored the question, does technology really cause us to lose skills? And why do people hate being told what to do? And how can we change their behavior anyway? Built for Tomorrow also digs into the surprisingly controversial history of things that we love today like teddy bears, which are apparently the most subversive toy in history. 
or umbrellas, which the British once refused to use. This show is an optimistic take on most of these subjects. The host, Jason Pfeiffer, is also the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. So check it out. Find Built for Tomorrow wherever you get your podcasts. All right, so a few more details on my setup. You can see a lot of this in the show notes if you're interested. It's a rather dull Jupiter notebook that leads into one plot. I'm going to describe that plot for you here, but another few details on how I got my data set. Initially, I was going to grab random pages from Wikipedia. I don't know if you noticed there's a random button on the side to get just a random page, but it kind of always gives me boring results. It'll be like a page for some county that has, you know, five people living in it. So I wanted to get something a bit more, I don't know, representative. There's lots of ways I could have done this. For example, Wikipedia shares its page view data. I could have gotten the most popular pages today or even over the past year or so. Actually, they delete the old records. So last six months, let's call it that, whatever they share. But I found an easier approach, given that this is just kind of a simple test, nothing rigorous or even for publication. There is a page on Wikipedia called Wikipedia colon vital articles. This page basically has a thousand of kind of the core ideas or pages or most popular stuff on Wikipedia, setting aside the definition exactly. This is just a good sampling of a thousand articles. All right, so I just grabbed the A's. I've got stuff like Abraham Lincoln, abstract art, acid-base reaction, Adam Smith, addiction, Adolf Hitler, Africa, afterlife. You guys get it. So I grabbed a thousand pages from English Wikipedia from that list and the same from simple English Wikipedia. That was a slightly brittle process. There were a couple pages that didn't exist in both places, some weirdness with the library I was using, but all told, I got my corpus without too much pain. Next step, I'm computing those scores across both data sets, and we're going to look at the histograms then. Why histograms? Because I want to see how the distributions stack up against each other. Now, if you've pulled up the visual from the show notes, give me a moment to explain that. I've switched now to the other of the pair of readability tests. So earlier I described the flesh reading E score, the one that runs from 0 to 100. For this example, I'm going to switch to the other one just so we can touch on both. But also, I personally find this one more intuitive, but that's because it's for a U.S.-centric audience. So let me give you a quick summary for international people. In the U.S., we begin education around the age of five or six in something called kindergarten, or let's call it grade zero, even though no one does, but they should. That's what it is. Start the kids in computer science early. Let's call it grade zero. You move on, hopefully, to grade one, two, three, so on and so forth, up until about grade 12, which is the end of what we call high school. And that completes about the age of 18. So from five to 18 is your primary training, and those are grades zero to 12. And that's the scale that the flesh Kincaid grade level tries to output. If you don't know the U.S. grade system, think of it as grade plus six equals age. So I binned my data, or rather the NumPy library binned my data for me, and then I plotted my distributions, only to find that I have some extreme right tails. There are many pages, at, well, not many, a minority of pages on Wikipedia, both English and simple English, which get absurd scores from the flesh Kincaid grade level. I don't think of that as a gotcha moment and saying, well, it's giving a ridiculous result, let's throw this out. For me, given that it's the minority of cases, I'll look at those outliers, because that's always fun to do, and then probably just add some sort of ceiling value to it, like cap everything at 20 or 25 or something like that. Now, when I started to look at that long tail, something that caught my attention was how much weight was in it from the simple English Wikipedia. Although, of course, the most extreme value was a regular English Wikipedia page that got a score of 239. There were a lot of simple English pages that were very high even up to 208. So how did this score get it so wrong? Well, when I looked into it, I developed a very quick hypothesis that was anecdotally correct with a couple of pages I double-checked, because actually I was worried it was a bug in my code. It wasn't, at least not this time. <laughs> the best way I could describe it is it was sort of a extreme value, really. Remember, we're dealing with those ratios, in particular, like words per sentence. And sometimes, in an effort to describe a complicated process from a finite list of simple English words, you have to jump through some mental gymnastics. I think I described a little bit of that earlier. You wind up with things that, I wouldn't call them run-on sentences, but they're definitely bulky sentences 
where even the authors have to kind of invent a sort of mechanism that they then repeat and, and reference back to. It's kind of clever how they do it, and it ends up having this unintentional skewing on this metric. Now, this is the minority of pages, just those long tails. So the metric isn't perfect, but it's not intended to be. It's simple and arithmetic. All right, enough with the tails. Let's talk about the actual shapes of these distributions I get back after I make histograms of my data. I get a not quite Gaussian shape, sort of like a Poisson kind of a shape, which is nice. That's a smooth, predictable distribution, as I was expecting. Two of them, actually, because I've got simple English Wikipedia and regular English Wikipedia. And for this simple test, this empirical result, I'm getting exactly the results I was hoping for. The flesh Kincaid grade level score, when looked at together, simple English is left skewed and kind of shifted, similar shape, but left implying much lower level of grades required to understand the page when compared to English. Almost a surprisingly good separation to the point where I say, hey, that fine tuning that I was semi-criticizing a bit ago it actually seems to fall pretty well in line with, mind you, a data set that they couldn't have had in 1975. Now let's get a little bit more into the brass tacks here. Talk about median values, the middle-of-the-road scores. Median value for English Wikipedia page 15.3. That's the equivalent of about three years in college, almost done with a four-year bachelor's program. That seems a little high to me. I feel like... The average Wikipedia page is understandable by a high school student, but it's been a while since I've been a high school student. Maybe I'm overestimating here. <laughs> anyway, median for simple English, 10.1, or roughly speaking, sophomore year in high school, about 16 years of age, give or take. And there again, I feel like that's a bit inflated, that Simple English might actually come off as pandering to a high school student, who I think has achieved a pretty good ability to read by that point. But what do I know? I just know a little bit about machine learning. And in that regard, I don't care so much about the actual, whether it fits the grade level correctly. I'm not a librarian trying to decide what section to put a book in here. So how can this be useful to me? Well, first of all, broadly, because it's simple to calculate and efficient and good for streaming and all that stuff I was saying earlier... Maybe if I have a pipeline, a natural language processing pipeline that I don't want to compute an embedding for everything that comes through and then run some heavy-duty, heavy-resource-demanding process on it, perhaps I can do a first-phase filter. This or this in combination with some simple classifier could take a quick run at the data efficiently and prioritize things I want to look at depending on what I'm looking for. More broadly and maybe more simply and more accessible for a lot of you guys, the main area that I find this interesting for is as a tool in the feature engineering process. So when you get some text data, you can't directly feed that into an algorithm. First of all, because it's just text. What are you going to give it, the ASCII values of each letter? And secondly, because most text is of arbitrary length, whereas most machine learning approaches need fixed length of input. And as some of you know, there's a wonderful, relatively new solution to that, and it's embeddings, where they'll take an arbitrary amount of text and compute a fixed-length vector, something like BERT or GPT-3. Those resulting vectors are spookily useful for machine learning algorithms. They find useful features in those large dimensional embeddings. But they might also find useful features in things like the flesh readability tests. So if you're in the midst of a natural language processing project, I mean, first and foremost, just try and throw an embedding at it. You should be able to run BERT pretty easily. It needs a lot of memory. But there's some services out there that can get you vectors. In fact, I might be able to help you in a couple of weeks with that. The majority of natural language processing problems I encounter are classification problems. You want to take some text and label it. In a simple case, spam or not spam. Perhaps in a more complex case, you want a sentiment, something along these lines. The reading ease, I don't suppose, would relate too much to sentiment, although you could prove me wrong with an interesting example. But how about something like predicting the content that uh, might be most receptive to a community? Perhaps you work for a content site and you want to prioritize or personal results on a home page or something along those lines. Some people who want to skim and get quick headlines might tend to want things that have a lower reading ease. Whereas if you're an engrossed reader who wants these long-form stories, perhaps you would really prefer things that are labeled as lower reading ease. This feature alone is not going to get you anywhere. 
But as one of a suite of clever feature engineering techniques you come up with, you might squeeze enough bits of information out of your text data to effectively build that classifier you need. So despite being a little simple and almost crude in its construction, its efficiency and seeming usefulness make it worth your time to check out these scores. So don't underestimate the usefulness of something like this. Of course, it really depends on your use case, but sometimes even simple things like these can be efficient and effective. Well, that's my take on the Flesh Kincaid readability tests. I'm actually about to bring that up with a guest I'm going to interview shortly, which you'll hear on our final episode of Pilot Season. Stay tuned for that next week.